test. Okay. How many of you always wanted a dog as a kid, but never could get one because of your mom? Yeah, most of us, of course. And she's watching today. <laughs> so last July, at a barbecue, a friend arrives with a foster female German Shepherd. Her name was Tuffy. And of course, after a couple of margaritas, I decided to adopt her. The following day, not remembering anything I had dedicated myself to, I found myself with a dog. And uh, in, on the 4th of August, 2020, I was at a distant lake with some friends and enjoying the water and the warm weather. Going back home, there was a huge black cloud over the port of Beirut with sparkles. I didn't mind it very much because, you know, uh, odd stuff happens in Beirut all the time, most of the time. At 6 p.m., I got home. And rather than sitting in the living room, which was full of glass, I decided to give Tuffy a shower. At 6.08, the world went dark. I was propelled against the wall, and all I could see was rubble and dust, and all I could hear was sirens and screams, and not understanding what was happening. I came out of the rubbles, most of the walls partially fallen, and I was searching for my mom and my sister, trying to make sense of what was all of this chaos. And luckily, no one was hurt. The 15 minutes that followed the explosion were the worst in my life, because you have to call to see who is alive and who is dead. And after securing the building, I head straight down to our neighborhood. And on the road, all you see is glass, blood, and dead bodies. It was a post-war scenery, unbelievable. Heading straight to the center of the explosion, you realize the magnitude and how much the city was destroyed. The streets where we have dinner, where you have your first shots, where you go out clubbing, like it's your home. Your home is supposedly the safest place on earth, but it was not. So I realized that washing the dog saved my life because the final count was more than 200 dead, more than 7,000 injured, and more than 300,000 displaced people. The same night, I went back home to sleep in a roofless home like most of Beirutis, realizing how lucky I was to, to be alive. And I couldn't help but think, is this the great tragedy of our time? Because as a Lebanese, we've grown up, most of us, on war, civil war stories. The following day, I did what was natural to do. I grabbed a broom, some gloves, and a mask because we were still in a pandemic, and head straight to the center of the explosion, trying to uh, be useful as much as possible. And to my surprise, I see more than 30 NGOs and more than 5,000 people on the ground, united as one, to start their city from scratch. Now, I don't know if you realized it, but starting a city from scratch. And all of this was citizen-led, NGOs-led. Beirut is a divided city on many aspects, but at this second, it felt like we were all in this together without second doubt, second options. And at this moment in time, your priorities shift because you go from worrying where to party on the weekend to, um, to where you're going to sleep tonight or what you're going to do to help your city. So in all of this chaos, none of us are engineers, none of us are rebuilders, we have no experience in construction. So you start on your ground, you start brooming where you are, where you are seated, where you are standing. And there was lots of work to do. So I joined forces with friends of mine, and we decided to move in the area. We went from home to home, building to building, neighborhood to neighborhood, trying to find uh, people to help, buildings to secure. And in this area, you had uh, meeting points clearly defined, and NGOs establishing headquarters where you could find supplies, food, and hotlines for people who needed help. So slowly but surely, you had a whole structure building up in order to efficiently allocate resources and help. So we were going, as I said, from homes to homes, meeting old people, restaurant owners, 
young families, most of them having lost a family member at least, and being totally helpless and desperate. But yet, hope remained. They all welcomed us with a happy face, and we were doing our best to get people home before winter to secure their houses. Now, in this post-war scenery, social media played a crucial role because prominent accounts and organizations were spreading information about where to go, what to do, who needed help, or how to help. And an explosion of this sort doesn't concern only the people in the area. It concerns the whole wide world. It's one of the biggest explosions in modern times. Especially the Lebanese diaspora, who scattered around the world, who was able to gather more than millions of dollars in a very short amount of time from the billions required to rehabilitate the area. So as mentioned before, we were moving from house to house, neighborhood to neighborhood, securing, helping, cleaning, reconstructing. And quickly, the cleaning and the reconstructing went to gathering data about each building and each individual. And why is this data important? Because we were able to allocate all of it in one single data set among all the organization to better visualize the city and allocate resources more efficiently and more quickly because time was against us. Now, a group of Lebanese in London were data scientists. They came together to launch the Open Map Lebanon. And Open Map Lebanon created the Beirut Recovery Map, who was also in collaboration with Rice University. They were gathering data from all organizations and all people in Lebanon in order to obtain this final map. Now, why is this map very important? Because it helps you in a very short amount of time to better visualize the area that were not cleaned or secured or where to uh, dispatch resources and allocate help. So data analytics played a crucial and important role in this post-war scenery. And again, it was all citizen-led and uh, NGOs driven. The way the people came together in this post-war scenery was astonishing and very inspiring. Now, we're here today under the thematic of starting from scratch, and we all do so on a daily basis. Starting from scratch goes from conflict to reconciliation, because this is how you seek progress. All of us, we have conflicts in our lives, whether on a micro scale or on a macro scale, it doesn't matter. And in order to progress and to evolve, you have to reconcile with your conflicts. This concept is also supported by one of my favorite authors, Yuval Harari. And the people of Beirut had to reconcile on a tremendous and horrific scope because no one deserves such a fate. Now, the way they came together surely was inspired, but we should not await disasters to come together, but we should do so in order to avoid them. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.